grace and peace and welcome to Eastminster Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you could join us this morning in the sanctuary as well as online. If you could please take a moment to pass the act of friendship pad located along the center aisle, taking note of who is worshiping near you, I guess, um, and uh, be able to share greetings with them following worship. A few things to highlight in uh, the bulletin. On Monday, Stephen's ministry is having a meeting in the NPR uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. This is an informational meeting. If you've ever wanted to learn more about the Stevens ministry program and how to get involved and be part of that, this is a meeting for folks that might be interested in learning more about the program. There's a couple um, collections that are happening within the congregation and information that's happening. You can see information about that in the bulletin, Christmas shoeboxes, Salvation Army uh, STEAM program. And I believe there's a list of items that they're collecting and looking for in the back in the green uh, pieces of paper. Um, also, we would ask for your continued prayers for Joe Watson and family. Um, the, the funeral for Paul Watson Jr., her grandson, will be this uh, Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Let us come together as the body of Christ and let us worship God as one. Please join with me in the responsive call to worship. The psalmist declares, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you, God, forever because of what you have done. In the presence of the faithful, let us proclaim God's name, for it is good.
In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile all things. Trusting in Christ, let us seek God's forgiveness together. Merciful Savior, you stand beside us, yet we prefer to stand on our own. You choose us, yet we choose worry. You attend to us, yet we attend to our work. Forgive us, gentle teacher. Call us by name and visit us once more that we might find at your feet joy, our purpose, and our hope. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. By his body and his cross, Jesus reconciled all who were once estranged. Christ in you is the glory of God. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you. Please turn and share that peace in a way you feel comfortable. Reading from Genesis chapter 18. God appeared to Abraham at the oaks of Mamre. While he was sitting at the entrance of his tent, it was the hottest part of the day, and he looked up and saw three men standing. He ran from his tent to greet them, and he bowed before them. And he said, Master, if it please you, stop for a while with your servant. I'll get some water so you can wash your feet. Rest under this tree. I'll get some food to refresh you on your way, since you are travelers and you have been brought across my path. They said, certainly, go ahead. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. He said, hurry, get three cups of your best, our best flour. Knead it and make bread. Then Abraham ran to the cattle pen and picked out a nice plump calf and gave it to the servant who lost no time in getting it ready. Then he got curds and milk and brought them with the calf that had been roasted and set the meal before the men and stood there under the tree while they ate. The men said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? He said, in the tent. One of them said, I am coming back. And about this time next year, when I arrive, your wife, Sarah, will have a son.
Thank you, Janice. It's always wonderful to see gifts from the congregation. Reading from the Gospel of Luke. Luke. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She also had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her, then, to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promise never to break covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of generations, speak your eternal word, the word that does not change, that we may respond to your gracious promises with faithful, obedient lives. We ask all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Shane Claiborne uh, tells a story of an unlikely moment of hospitality in his book, Irresistible Revolution. If you're not familiar with Shane Claiborne, uh, he is a pastor, an activist, And um, he went to the same college that I did about four years before I was there at Eastern University near the city of Philadelphia. And he tells this story uh, about uh, something that happened in the year 1995. He was attending Eastern University and he and several other students were discussing an article that they read in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Now, You can already tell how dated that is. College students reading a newspaper. I mean, that that enough is pretty wild. But they're reading this article from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it was about a neighborhood called Kensington. Kensington is one of the worst areas of the city of Philadelphia. They often nickname it the Badlands. It's an area that you do not want to go. One of the things that the city of Philadelphia was facing, still is facing, is a housing crisis like so many of our communities and our cities where we have homes that have been abandoned, places that not have not been cared for, and a lack of housing for so many different folks. Well, a group of families was struggling with a how, this housing crisis. And, excuse me. And they got together and they decided to move into a church. It was a closed cathedral. It was a Catholic church that the Catholic Diocese of Philadelphia had closed about a decade before that. And it was just sitting there taking up an entire city block. And it made the news media that all these families that were struggling with this this crisis and were homeless were now living in this church. So they're reading this article, and they, like a lot of college students, can operate on a whim. They said, let's go drive down there and meet them. So a group of these college students climbed in the car and then drove into an area of Philadelphia you're not supposed to go in, um, knocked on the sanctuary door, and someone answered the door, immediately inviting this group of five or six into the sanctuary. They looked around. The families had moved the pews uh, away from uh, the center. There was beds there and little areas that people were living in. Families of all ages, older folks as well as folks with kids. 
And so these college kids asked them what they should do. Is there a way they could help? Could they collect something? Is there something that they could do? Well, the other part of the article had said the Diocese of Philadelphia was upset the fact that these people were living in this church, understandably. And they had given them about 48 hours to vacate the property or they would be arrested. And what these families said to these college students is, we'd really like it if you just stayed here. We know if homeless people get arrested, it's not going to make a headline. If 25 college kids from the suburbs get arrested, you better believe it's going to make the paper. They went back to uh, Eastern, back to college, after having that meeting, and they put a flyer up around for a meeting that they would have that night. The flyer said, Jesus is getting kicked out of a church in North Philadelphia. Come to this meeting, 10 o'clock. Shane Claiborne and his friends figured a couple guys or a few couple people would show up. When he got there, the room was completely filled. And they discussed what they would do up, what they would do. They decided as a group that some of them wanted to show up, and dozens of them moved in to this cathedral, living alongside these homeless families as the clock continued to click, 48 hours. They began collecting items that were needed by these families, and then the 48th hour finally came. The news media had started to wait outside the church to see what would happen, what would transpire. Two representatives of the archdiocese showed up in a car, and as Shane Claiborne tells it, they got out of the car, they saw the college kids, they saw the media, and they immediately got back in the car. But this kept going. This wasn't a thing they did for a couple days. This saga continued actually over years. There was an air horn that they would uh, carry on campus, believe it or not. Um, And if they heard, if they got a phone call from these homeless families that the police were coming, these college students would sound the air horn on campus And kids would jump in their car and drive down to Philadelphia to make sure that these families were not abandoned. The diocese started to take on different means to get them removed from the cathedral. At one point, they decided to have the building declared a fire hazard. And they said, we're going to have this building inspected. About a day or so before the inspection was to take place, around midnight, there was a knock on the door, as the story goes, and two men were there dressed in fire gear. Fire gear. The people who answered the door said, no, the inspection's not till tomorrow. And they said, no, you're misunderstanding why we're here. We could get in a lot of trouble for being here. We've come to help. And they proceeded to walk the entire building with this group of homeless families and college students, pointing out all the areas that the fire marshal would be upset about, handing them dozens and dozens of smoke detectors. A day or so later, when the fire marshal came, he said, the building passes code. There's nothing we can do to declare it a fire emergency. After a couple years, the standoff eventually ended. The families were able to find housing, and everyone moved out of the cathedral. Our lectionary this morning, the lectionary that we're participating in, shares with us two familiar stories of hospitality. The first one is the story of Abraham, and the second of Mary and Martha. 
At this point in the Abrahamic cycle, what Abraham has received from God is a lot of promises. He's received a lot of promises from God that he would have offspring, that they would have a land, that they would have a great reward, that they would have a long life, that their, his name would be made great, that he would be a blessing to the world and to all the nations. But in this moment of this story, God has made all these promises to him, but none of those promises have come true. Abraham is sitting like many of us, knowing of God's love, of God's promise, but not feeling that promise in that moment, longing for some hope. This is the Abraham who sits under these trees, one who doesn't understand how God could ever fulfill these promises. And that's when he sees these three visitors under these trees. Hospitality is an absolutely essential tenet to this culture in this time period. It was incredibly dangerous to travel. If you traveled, there was danger from thieves, from getting lost, no GPS systems, um, no maps, storms, wild animals. And if you had a problem, who are you going to call for help? Nobody. And what we see is Abraham doing what he needs to do in this story to fulfill his cultural component. He meets the men, offers them shade, asks Sarah to prepare the best meal that they can afford. This would have been considered a Bedouin feast. The preacher Thomas Long says that Abraham perceived their need in this moment, telling Sarah to make three cakes out of, to make cakes or bread out of three measures of choice flour. The thing you might not realize just reading this in English and not knowing these measurements is this is an obscene amount of flour. One measure of flour is 32 cups. So this is 96 cups of flour. I don't know if I've ever seen a loaf of bread that big. <laughs> but then it goes further in this story because Abraham, you know, slaughters this calf. He has a servant slaughter this calf. Well, even if this was a relatively young calf in this moment, you're talking about 30 pounds of meat that would have been produced from this calf, prepared alongside curds and milk. And then Abraham, as culturally, culturally needed, would have given all this to these three visitors, this ridiculous, over-the-top, amazing feast, and he would have stood there waiting to see if they needed anything else. He took on that moment, the aspect of a servant. He was not only the host, but he was a servant. He could have responded in different ways. He would have been going against his culture, but he could have responded by not welcoming, viewing them as enemies or others or outsiders, not wanting to deal with them but he does what he is called to do. He treats them as honored guests, even though they could have been dangerous in that moment. And this is one of the ways God frequently gets described in scripture. God is often described as a God of hospitality. In Psalm 78, it is God who spreads the table in the wilderness for the people. Or Psalm 23, that beloved psalm, that God prepares a table for us in the presence of our own enemies. The theme of divine hospitality is throughout all of Scripture. And it is a call and a challenge to us to show hospitality to others, to stop thinking about people as others and thinking about them as honored guests. 
We also see this theme of hospitality running through the Mary and Martha story. It's a story which I don't always like the way I've heard other preachers talk about it. Frequently, what they do is they kind of pit Mary and Martha against each other, right? That there is some sort of ancient dispute between these two sisters that we get to moderate from our pews. Who's the best disciple here? Is it the one who's showing the hospitality, the one who's doing all the work, who's serving the guests, or is it the one who's sitting at the feet of the master? I understand how pastors and preachers have ended up with this interpretation. And in it, Mary come, Martha comes across as frustrated, overwhelmed, self-righteous. But I really think this interpretation is just too binary. It's just too black and white. There's a lot going on in the cultural background that we miss as modern people living in this day and age. And I don't think it's them against one another. I think it's a little bit different. One of the first things you have to note in this passage is the first lines of the text. How is it described? Whose home are they going to? They are going to Martha's house. Martha welcomes Jesus in this moment. And there's three things that are absolutely clear from that phrase alone. Martha is no longer married. We know that because a husband would have been mentioned if there was a husband. So this is Martha's house, and that is an extremely important detail. We also know that she must have been wealthy because to live without a husband was to live without security in this day and age, and people just didn't do it. So we know she's wealthy, we know she's not married anymore, and it is clear that it's Martha who is doing the act of Abraham in this moment. It is Martha who is offering the hospitality to Jesus and his followers in this moment. The other part that is so important about this is the placement of the story in the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke follows a pattern. What Jesus is perpetually trying to do in the Gospel of Luke is to prepare his disciples for mission, right? We hear these stories where the, where the disciples go out with Jesus and they go out and they share the good news that God's kingdom is coming. And what the pattern is you see in the Gospel of Luke is a moment of proclamation and then a moment of doing the work of the kingdom. So you hear a proclamation story and then you hear a mission story. You hear a proclamation moment and then a moment of Jesus's doing a miracle or something like that. And this story follows that pattern. The scene directly before this is the parable of the Good, Good Samaritan. This was the moment of proclamation. A man was on a journey. It was a short journey, but a man was on a journey, and he was attacked. He should have received hospitality, but instead he was robbed, beaten, and left for dead. And the least likely of heroes, the hero we're not supposed to like when we read this story, is the one who shows hospitality, the one who does the work. That is the moment of proclamation. The Mary and Martha story is the moment where we put the proclamation into place. Martha sets about her tasks, her tasks of table service, of many tasks. The word for this in Greek is diokonia. It is the root word where we get deacons. So that understanding of deacons is in this. It is also the term in which we pull ministry from. And it's particularly understood of ministry of the table, ministry of communion. So what Martha is doing is she is preparing a meal that is understood as a ministry. 
And it is very clear from the text that her work is needed, it is valid, and it is what she is called to do in that moment. Where the problem comes is that Martha assumes all her work is necessary. She went in this moment with the best of intentions, wanting to show Jesus and his followers a moment of hospitality. But what she misses is that there's only one right way to follow Jesus. That's what she thinks in this moment, is there's only one way to do it, and I do it the right way, and therefore everybody else should do it the right way. That's what's behind that question. I'm sure we've all ran into that. Maybe some of us have had said things like that at times. This is the distraction. That is the distraction that Martha falls for. She should have in that moment taken a moment of self-examination. But instead, what she does is she makes someone else her problem. Mary becomes her problem. It had nothing to do with Mary. And I love Jesus' response in this. It's very telling. He calls out her name twice. Martha, Martha. There's only one thing that is needed. And it is the central concern of the Gospel of Luke. Trust in God. That service without centering, that service on God is incomplete. All service needs to flow from our trust in God. And Mary, for her part, is a silent witness, right? We don't hear from Mary. She just sits there. We don't know what she's thinking or what she's feeling. We just know she sits there. And Jesus says she has chosen the better part. But it's not the only part. It's the better part in this moment. It's one aspect of trusting God, not the only aspect of trusting God. But the other thing to catch here is how Mary is breaking tradition and cultural boundaries. She's doing this silently without saying anything. The scholar N.T. Wright describes it this way. He says that homes in this period were divided into male space and female space. And I don't mean a man cave. Male space and female space. And they never crossed each other. So what Mary is doing is she is absolutely crossing an invisible and critical boundary. The public room, the front room in these homes at this time is where men and men only met. That's it, guys. The kitchen, the other rooms... The ladies could go back there. But guess who didn't go back there? The men. The women would stay in the kitchen. They would stay unseen by outsiders. That is the space that belonged to women. So the fact that Mary in this moment sits in the public room in the front of the house is absolutely scandalous. This is insane. And in her silence, she does something else as well. Something that is often missed. When you sit at the seat, at the feet of a rabbi, you're claiming something in that moment. What you're claiming by sitting at the seat of the rabbi is that you want to become the rabbi. Mary, she's breaking every cultural boundary in this moment that's possible. And I think that is what is upsetting Martha. That Mary is claiming that she wants to be a preacher, a teacher, a disciple of Jesus in the kingdom of God. This is not a story about 
active spirituality, that what Martha was doing was active spirituality, and what Mary was doing was passive spirituality. This is a story that is a conversation about tradition and the prophetic call of the church. Those traditions we uphold in the church, those traditions that we maintain, the status quo and the prophetic tradition that pushes against them. It's almost as if Martha is saying, we didn't do it that way. And Mary is pushing against it. The reality is though, neither of these traditions can exist without one another. Each tradition needs each other to live and thrive. Let us pray. God who calls us, God who calls us to tradition and to prophetic ministry, God who calls us to renewal, to life, God who calls us to follow your Holy Spirit and your speaking. Bless our hearing and bless our doing. In Christ's name, amen. Let us affirm our faith together by reading from the Confession of 1969. The life, death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on the inhumanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences of the church's own complicity in injustice in the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of human life in society and of God's victory over all wrong. The church follows this pattern in the form of its life and in the method of its actions. So to live and serve is to confess Christ as Lord. Please be seated. The book of James tells us that every generous act of giving is itself a gift from God above. Let us offer to God our gifts and our lives.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we dedicate these gifts of time, talent, and treasure to you. God, we thank you for the call that you have placed on this church. Help us to be your faithful people. We ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Remember that you can submit prayer concerns to the church by calling or emailing or dropping a note uh, with one of the ushers. There are several uh, folks that we continue to be in prayer for today. Uh, We're in prayer for Miranda Bowersox and Baby Journey, Amy Foxwell, Judy Lightfoot, uh, Graham McMillan, Dave McIntosh, Lois Moore, Kathy Purcell, Catherine, uh, D. Hoyt, and we're also in prayers for uh, Paul, family and friends of Paul Watson uh, Jr. Let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers may serve your will and show your steadfast love to this world. God, our creator, we pray for the world that you have made. Overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong. Feed and satisfy those who thirst for your justice so that all your children may freely enjoy your creation and joyfully sing your praises. Help us to be good stewards, O God, of what you have entrusted to us, that your glory may be seen in your creation. Gracious God, you have called us. You have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in the faith, breaking bread together, proclaiming the good news so that all may believe your love and turn to your ways. We pray for the unity of the church and the unity of our nation, O God, that we may see common problems and seek to overcome those problems. Break down the walls of hostility, O God, that divide us. Send peace on earth Put down greed and pride and anger, which turn nation against nation and race against race. Speed the day, O God. Speed the day when wars will end. O God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbor, remove from us hate and prejudice and from all people, so that all your children may be reconciled to one another and to live in peace with one another. Hope of the earth. Give vision to all those who govern, that they would do that with goodwill and justice, that they would draw the world together as one. And God, this day, we know that you bear the pain of the world. And God, we ask you to look upon with compassion those that we know in our own community that are sick and in need of healing. We pray for Miranda and Journey and Amy and Judy and Graham and Dave and Lois and Kathy and Catherine, and Dee. God, we ask you to be with them as they recover, be with them as they face upcoming surgeries and moments of your need. May we be a community that surrounds them with your love and your grace. Cheer them by your word. Bring healing to them. And God, this day, we also lift up those who are grieving Paul Watson, Jr., God, be with them in their grief. May they know that you grieve alongside them. God of all generations, we praise you for all your servants, all those who have been faithful to you on earth and that now live with you in eternity. 
Keep us in fellowship with them until we meet them with all your children in the joy of your eternal kingdom. And it is the hope of that eternal kingdom that we pray the prayer you taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> May you be blessed by the example of Abraham, Martha, and Mary. And may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and the peace in believing, so that you may abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.